So hi everyone and thank you for joining us. I am Hippie Fit Mom reporting for iGirl Tech News and today I have Valerie Jennings from Jennings Social Media Marketing and Viral Bolt Media with me. I'm so excited because media is so important when it comes to business and today's society. Jennings Social Media Marketing or GS, JSMM was founded in 2003 and is a full service agency that combines the art of iron online storytelling with the science of measuring quantifiable results. The company provides social media, public relations, search engine optimization, content marketing, and web development for publicly traded companies to startups. JSMM was founded by Valerie at the age of 24. Valerie is also the founder of Viral Bolt Media. The company provides YouTube video production distribution, social sharing, and online marketing campaigns, incorporating the latest social media strategies to help business exceed in their marketing efforts. So thank you so much for uh, joining us today. And um, can you tell us a little bit about your companies and why you started them? Well, thank you for the awesome intro. Maybe I need to hire you too. <laughs> that was fantastic. Uh, we do a lot. And so sometimes it's hard for people to understand what our companies do. So that's a great question to start with. Um, so the reason I started joining social media marketing, quite frankly, I, it was a shot in the dark. I wasn't planning to start a business. I do come from a long line of entrepreneurs, but I, I was honestly, like anybody else, I had you know, started my career in, in journalism, crisis communications, did a lot of government relations. I wrote for a local city paper. I, I did a little bit of uh, local broadcast covering uh, city affairs, and I, I needed to transition. I, I made a relocation move, and I was kind of sitting there saying, I need to figure out what I really want to do with all this these skills that I had accumulated. And of course, my family was asking me, why do you have such a crazy resume? Why do you have political and government and media? And I said, I promise you, I will figure it out and I'll put it all together. So when I, when I was sitting there, 24, moved, didn't know anybody, I said, all right, I'm going to start with some, some things that I know I love, my true passions in life. And I, I know I loved working with people, consulting, and telling their stories. And that's probably my biggest strength, is really sitting down, getting to know somebody, just like a journalist does, just like what you do, that's still our core strength and our passion. So I, I basically started my business out of something I loved. And I decided to move in a direction of, of PR at the time um, and built up my political contacts in the Kansas market. And honestly, I just took a chance. Mm -hmm. So why did I start? It wasn't a calculated plan. I didn't go to some fancy business school. I didn't have anybody barking up my tree saying, you need to start a business. In fact, my, my family actually opposed it. Oh. They, you know, they thought I should do the traditional route and, and work for somebody else. And I had done that early on, and I enjoyed that. But I felt like it was time for me to do something very different and take a chance. And I think it's also just in your DNA. You know, when you come from a long line of entrepreneurs, people can tell you, you need to do this, you need to do that. But sometimes your genetic makeup just, you know, just predisposes you to what you're going to end up doing with your life. So it, in a, you know, in a sense, it worked out. Mm -hmm. And I'm very happy where I am. But that's kind of a long roundabout way of saying that's really honestly how I started the company. I didn't have a plan. I just did it. Yeah. So. That's the best way. That's the best yeah, way. Yeah, sometimes it is. The no plan is the plan. Yeah, definitely. And I agree. And I love that story. And I can relate to it so well. <laughs> so, But media is so important to incorporate into our marketing strategies. But there is a technical side to it that goes beyond shooting a video and posting it online. So can you share with us why it is so important to understand the technical side of online media? Oh, absolutely. Um, especially in today's media era, you know, when we look at hiring people for our team, we're looking at people who are creative, who are great storytellers, who are social media enthusiasts, and who actually can run software. Mm -hmm. So it used to be you could go to school, you could get a journalism degree or a PR degree, and you could get a job pretty much anywhere. But and you still can in a sense, but the ones that are, are really the, the top of the pool as far as talent goes, 
you have to understand the technology behind it. You have to understand the search algorithms. You have to understand how to read a Google Analytics report or impression data, uh, buying personas. So even when you, you know, create that magnificent video, you still have to understand the software to upload it on, different delivery um, mechanisms, how the search algorithms will index that video, the how the different social media channels based on the way they operate on the back end are going to help you push your video through search engines, um, maybe even use some other uh, distribution software like OneLoad if, if you want to push to multiple video sites at the same time. So there's there is a lot more to it. And I find it's the hardest thing that recent grads have to face. How am I supposed to know all this stuff? None of, you know, like I'm not getting this exposure uh, coming out of school. And so we are actually doing a lot of on, on job training, you know, helping them understand and helping them walk through. They may have some minimal exposure, but they don't really know how to read necessarily an analytics report or how does SEO and, and write, even writing that video description work. Um, I find that people are more intuitive today than they used to be with looking at a brand new piece of software and figuring out how to interact with it. So that's definitely, we're doing something right in our education and our indoctrination process early on. But yeah, it is a huge part of the job. Yeah, and I agree. And I, I believe that schools are now, just now, starting to introduce those kind of things into their curriculum. I mean, because when I was in school in business, um, I went to school for business and we didn't learn any of that kind of stuff. Right. And it's very important to know and to incorporate that into your marketing strategy for sure. Absolutely. Yeah. We're also educating our clients a lot on how this software works and how it fits into their marketing. And the technology is there to make things easier, but we still find a lot of our clients are very overwhelmed by the process of taking them through not only what social media channels you need to use, but we're, we're saying we need to look at your buying personas, your competitors. We need to evaluate the science behind why they're doing certain things. What is the keyword search um, popularity trends look like? How are we going to measure and score your campaign performance? It, it's so much for them to, to take in and part of, you know, part of that education is just going to have to keep catching up with itself. We're a lot further along than we used to be as far as people understanding what is social media, but there's so much misinformation or poor information out there that we are actually inheriting a lot of clients who've been duped into fancy contracts because they didn't understand how the technology worked. Yes, definitely. It's definitely gotten to a point where it's very overwhelming, for sure. Yeah. <laughs> Can you talk a little bit about VBM and Jennings Social Media, and what do you do for companies beyond just the education? Like, what what is it specific that you really do for them? Well, in, so these are two separate companies. Jennings Social Media Marketing, I've had for 11 years. Viral Media is, is about uh, two years old. And so Jennings is the SEO, content marketing, and PR outreach. We're, we're helping clients design their social media campaigns. We're writing all the content for them. We're search engine optimizing it. We're designing promotional offers, integrating with any other digital components that they're using, like if it's text messaging, email marketing, uh, sales collateral. And we're actually helping them through a consultative process of where are your prospects? What do they look like? How do we help your sales team align with the online marketing? So we are actually developing a lead generation program for the business. So we take a very holistic approach from the consultative all the way to the execution and then and monitoring the results in between. And we'll make, you know, maybe small turns along the way as the marketing matures. You know, what else needs to be introduced? So we'll lay out, you know, a 60 day, 90 day benchmark and then we keep adding to it we continue to add layers as it performs viral bolt media is more project space that's the web design and development the the web video um, creation and production mobile sites and apps so those two companies work together nine times out of ten most of the clients will come in through Jennings and they'll need the extra support and so VBM and Jennings very much work in a holistic way 
where the client isn't faced with, you know, multiple vendors, multiple team leaders, they can basically come through, they get, you know, secured with our company, and then we can introduce the experts that will help them through the other digital components. And so far, it's worked out well. Mm -hmm. I kind of, it feels a little like deja vu, because I remember when I started with Jennings, and I was like, oh, God, this is so much work. It's so hard. Oh. It's just a different kind of hard work. Yeah. And with, with social media content marketing, you're constantly educating yourself on best practices, the Google updates to the yeah. search engines, uh, you know, new emerging social media platforms, or here's a better way to engage and create brand ambassadors, VVM. It's again, like having a startup where we're bringing great clients in there. We have to keep adding new systems and processes um, and make sure that the technology and the systems are, you know, communicating and are succinct with, with our internal process. Mm -hmm. So it's a little, it's, we've, we've got a mature company and then the startup along with it. So oh, wow. I, don't know, I had to do it again, I suppose. Oh, Maybe yeah. I missed something the first time around. Why not? Why not? <laughs> But you, you started um, at the age of 24. What are yes. some of the difficulties you face as a young entrepreneur? God, I mean, <sighs> I can think of about 80 things to tell you, but I'll, I'll, I'll try to simplify it. <laughs> uh, so I've been asked frequently to come in and present in front of uh, startups and, and people who are in the early stages of going to market with their companies. And I, I look at them and I'm like, you have financial backing, you've been through an education program, you, you've been picked by your colleagues and peers in the industry, and you have all these people around you that are helping you get to that next best point. So your, your um, errors and omissions decrease and your success ratio goes up. I didn't do any of that. <laughs> I, I didn't even think about it. Yeah. I, like I said, you know, I, I knew I needed to do something different with my career. I knew I had all these skills I wanted to pull on and bring into uh, the business. I, I didn't think about I had to have a corporate lawyer or, you know, a really awesome finance director that I was in contact with 24-7. So I, I always say to people, make sure you have a great corporate lawyer, <laughs> even if it's somebody that's like, you know, for a startup and a great money person a financial advisor, a finance director, because you cannot make a single decision running a business without talking to your finance director every day. Yeah. A hiring decision, your profit margins, the best clients to go after. There's such a strategic methodology there. And I think because I didn't do the business courses, because I didn't, you know, find a, a mentor at 24 to help me through just the, the foundation and structure of the company, I, I struggled early on, you know, finding a rhythm, um, really understanding that there was a science behind the business. Mm -hmm. The back end has to be as solid as the front end for the company to be healthy. And I think that's where if I would have started over, I would have found, you know, the best of the best in a, in a financial person and one really good mentor that I could just, you know, call and, and brain dump on and say, this is what I'm doing, you know, today and I have to do this and I, I wasn't prepared for that. So you have a lot of reactionary decision making, which is never good. You never want to be in the defensive mode. That's when you're going to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. So... You know, that to me is, is, is the first and foremost and, and looking at um, being young. And there's a lot of young entrepreneurs these days that they don't make that mistake. Mm -hmm. That just happened to be where my area of weakness was that my background was so strong in creative arts and journalism and not enough in the, in the business operations side. When did you find your footing? I, th I would say... About six years ago, I finally felt like I was educated. And when I say it, because I had to work with so many different clients and I was exposed to so many different kinds of people and business experiences, I also took it upon myself to, to do some of my own external research, you know, to fact check things. Sometimes the experts are wrong. You know, sometimes they give you bad information and... I have also learned that, you know, you're, 
when you're an entrepreneur, you have really good instinct. And if something doesn't feel right to you, you, you should fact check it because mm -hmm. sometimes they are wrong or sometimes they're missing part of the story. So I, I feel like five, six years ago, I felt like I had enough education. I say, I might as well have an Ivy League degree. <laughs> the amount of lawyers and finance people that I've had to surround myself with to understand the nuances and not only in our industry, but social media in, in the law has, has changed so much and the copyright violations and, and the, the errors and omissions that we have in our industry that we didn't have before. It wasn't mature enough before. Those things didn't even exist in, in the legal field. So still, as much as I don't like being in that role, I'm forced to to look at the legal side and the financial side and, and where, where are the business's strengths and weaknesses and where do we need more support. Mm -hmm. So so anyway, yeah, that's that's probably, I, I could probably give a lot of good stories there. And when I do these interactive sessions, I get a lot of people who want, they want the juice. They want the juicy parts because they don't want to go through that. And if you yeah. can avoid it, it's best. Oh. Um, it's a hiring, hiring and firing not, is a nightmare. Um, yes. You know, I just, I think that's something else. You know, it's so hard to work with a lot of different types of personalities in the creative industry, keep everybody happy, continue to run a business, build morale. And we also have a unique system because our company is all virtual. We have clients we've never met. Oh, really? Yeah. Yeah, we have clients in Canada and on the West Coast that we have never met. They've been clients for years. I have people on my team. I've never physically met them. They're all in the States, but I've never physically met them. And so we have different challenges in how do we keep our morale healthy? How do we keep our team feeling connected and part of a culture when we're all virtual? Yeah. So, yeah, and that that's actually something that came out of, you know, this evaluation from – maturing the business and adopting to the challenges in social media and being so much on the responsive 24 seven nature of the business. How do we, how do we keep our foothold and be a thought leader and, and show that we, we are actually living in a social media culture. Mm -hmm. And so we moved away from the bricks and mortar office because of these reasons. And we've been able to attract talent across the U S because the people we're looking for, they're inspired by an entrepreneurship. They like the fact that they can hang on to their identity. They don't have to conform to a, the politics in an office and deal with all the, you know, the internal, how do I climb the ladder? We don't deal with that. That's yeah. not our, that's not our, our philosophy. I love it. So <laughs> we're, it's, it's hard and easy at the same time. It's, it's hard to find people who, who really flourish in that. Um, some people still want to go to an office, but we're finding with millennials, not so much. They don't care. They don't care as much. Um, and so when you say you can work anywhere and you can be anywhere, whenever, it, it's it's empowering. Yeah. I now take ownership of my role in this company because it really is on me to make sure I'm getting this work done. So this these are the types of things we've learned through the experiences over the years and. And we'll continue to make these type of adjustments because the industry keeps changing. Awesome. So, yeah. Awesome. And now you mentioned uh, social media and the, the changes that happen within that, that industry. What are some of the most significant changes in social media you, you've seen in the past years or even the past few months? Sure. Well, you know, as far as the past, I'll start with the past few months. You know, Google continues to dictate how social media performs its popularity. If, if Google pulls out support in social media, boy, I don't know. I mean, we can do <laughs> a whole nother paradigm shift. But because uh, the search engines are driven by the social media activity, businesses are getting it. They're, they're, real, they're actually, they've stopped asking the question, why do we need social media? And they've just kind of went, oh, we have to do it. Mm -hmm. So now it's a question of who does it 
how well is it done, and what you know types of best business practices exist. So in the last few months, we just continue to see the nuances evolve with search engine optimization, quality content, um, you know, actually valuing uh, people who have a journalism background. And then as far as looking back, you know, maybe over the last few years. You know, just the evolution of the social platforms and the and the advertising, um, we we continue to see fluctuations in how well the social networking ads do versus just content marketing. Our company does do both, but we definitely start with a solid editorial plan before we move in the ads platform. So Facebook, Facebook's ads platform is is experiencing some challenges. I think they're seeing a large abandonment rate among some industries. I don't see the contests performing as well as they used to. I remember I used to turn on a contest and bam, you would have like a you know gazillion followers. I'm like, wow, how did you do that? How did that happen? Yeah. But there's too much saturation. Um, people have, have kind of been there, done that. Uh, so you know, I'm, I'm not saying that Facebook is is going away. It's just it's. I think it's having some challenges, I especially think- on the business side. We have clients today that are saying, I don't want to even be on Facebook. And they're B2B, and because they're B2B, they don't see any value there. And, you know, to me, I agree. For B2C, there's tremendous value. B2B, what are you going to get? I mean, you just have a page, some branding. Um, you might get some website traffic, but it's it's not like Twitter. It's not like Google Plus or LinkedIn. And so, again, that's where how do, do you understand the technology, do you understand the platform and, and how it really works. Um, so, yeah, just the evolution and maturity of the ads platforms and, and adoption rates continue to change. Uh, Snapchat and Instagram are, are driving – uh, nuances in younger demographics and depending on our client we have to make sure we're ex- at least experimenting at least showing value there and making sure we're still relevant so we constantly have those types of challenges and opportunities of do are we moving our clients along on the right platforms today mm-hmm. and so we have to ask ourselves that on a, on a regular basis and then uh, PR keeps, you know, the public relations industry, and, and that's basically how I started. Um, you know, there's, there's still a push-pull. Whose role is it? Is it the PR agency's role to manage the social media channels? Is it the social media company's role to tell the PR people what needs to go on the social media channels? We are still sharing roles with large PR firms and how our team provides social media value and vice versa. So we're still using a collaborative model. And we still think that works best, but we also provide, um, you know, public relations outreach, pitching bloggers uh, and journalists as, as part of the social media campaigns because we find you can't really separate the two anymore. But if a company says, I have a PR agency, great, we'll work with them. You know, we'll come up with a, a model that works for your business. We're always about what's best for the client first. Cool. So th- those are some of the big changes. Cool. So um, for businesses, what would be your opinion on like the biggest mistakes that businesses make on social media? Because they do it a lot. (laughs) Even like even personalities. You, You see a lot of that lately. Sure. So blunders and just, you know, (laughs) missteps and like, oh God, somebody was having a moment or somebody didn't think Hootsuite right or what were they thinking? Yeah. You know, unfortunately it's human error. You know, you, you, people make mistakes and, and so you can only do damage control the best you can. I say the worst situations are when someone tries to do damage control and they make it worse. Uh (laughs) That's, um, we, we always tell our clients proceed with, with caution whenever you're trying to, to capitalize on a, on a news cycle, make sure it aligns with your brand. Make sure you're doing it in a tasteful way and it's not causing harm to anybody. Um, you know, we try to avoid that. But what what we do is we have an editorial process in place where we actually have multiple checks and balances oh. that it's checked by multiple people and the client before it can be distributed across social media platforms. So at least that minimizes some of the risk. Um, sometimes you've got to get stuff out. 
and and when you're rushing sometimes you know errors happen but it's how the companies handle it you know it, it it's just you, I know you see it a lot with the airlines the airlines get picked on all the time you know some guy got thrown off a plane because he yeah. tweeted something about somebody you know in security or one of the airline attendants I mean, people just make these decisions and it's real time. So, but as far as advice, you know, we, we always talk to the companies at first in a conservative manner and we say, what are your challenges today with your brand? Do you have a bad reputation online or are you just trying to get your brand out there and, and create some SEO buzz around it or you need PR and credibility? It's the ones that have the really bad brands online that, that all these customers go write all these horrible reviews about them and they never respond. They just let it sit there and rot and, and then it just festers and then more and more people see it and they go write more bad comments. And it says, you know, today one bad review can potentially cost you 30 customers. Wow. So, you know, that is a huge mistake by most brands is you don't have to be a publicly traded company to, to have your brand affected online. And if you, if you don't manage your reputation, then you might as well just start kissing some of your profit, your margins away. And, and they don't understand until you put it in their face and say, that one review, that could be 30 customers. What's your, your average you know, profit margin or your, your average revenue per customer? Well, then they start doing the math in their head and they realize that's a huge, huge, huge mistake we've just made. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's one. And, and for B2B, it's just not having a presence. I, believe it or not, there's so many clients that we end up working with that have been around for maybe 50 years or more that still don't have an online presence. That, I don't, that's a huge mistake. Yeah. So not doing anything and, and letting your online reviews fester and rot. I mean, you know, so those are the two biggies that we see. Those are great. Those are, um, and I think, I never thought about that. And I think you're, well, you're right on the um, letting that, that negative review fester. Because, oh, yeah. I mean, I think everyone, especially the younger generation, they go to the internet to see if I'm going to take a trip there or if I'm going to utilize this product. I mean, I always look at the reviews, always. Yep. So that's great advice. For women that are starting to, or uh, thinking to start a business, what advice would you give them? Uh, yeah, I mean, so for a woman that's thinking about starting a business, I say, well, why stop? I mean, women, we can conquer anything. Look at all the things that we do in a, any given day. We take care of kids. We run the household. We can run the books. We know how to run a business. We're great with people, and we're very intuitive. You know, if any woman has a doubt about starting a business, I would say, why would you even question it? We're designed to divide and conquer. We are designed to delegate. So, you know, why would we even question that? If you have a great idea and you feel like you've, you've divided it up and you figured out your pros and cons and your risks and, and rewards and, and you know how much time it's going to take, if you've got the group, why? I mean, why stop? So that would be my advice, especially to younger women. I mean, younger women are – they're experiencing rapid growth in their careers. They're realizing that they don't have to climb the ladder like the generations before them had to. I have the honor of working with a lot of successful female executives that are that are older than me, and, and I've learned the value of, A, being respectful, asking them a million questions about their career, understanding the challenges that they still face in, in corporate America, and really appreciating that I don't have to deal with that. Okay. But I want to understand because what's happening is the trailblazing that has gone on for the younger generations is why younger females are having more success today, especially in the technology industry. The doors are wide open and there's a shortage of female talent in the tech space. So if we have enough faith in ourselves and we can rally around our passions, I don't see why they would stop. And that's what I wanted to ask you because you did mention um, having challenges within the cor corporate world. Yes. The female. Now, I just wanted to know, is, is that some of the, does that? It's different challenges. 
Oh, it's yeah. Challenges? I think it's different today. So I haven't, I don't, I can't see from what I've learned talking to the, the female corporate executives that have been in there for, you know, more than a decade. I, I don't think that I'm having the same challenges they've had. They had to do the actual ladder climbing. They had to really pay their dues. Mm -hmm. And I haven't felt like I've had to do it in, in that sort of chronological order. I've been able to make some, some leaps and, and big jumps along the way. So from that standpoint, they've kind of broken down the barriers of you don't have to go step by step to get to your end goal. What I have felt that I have faced because I was 24 and I hadn't worked for a big agency and nobody knew me and I didn't have like huge financial backing. I didn't feel like people took me seriously. Yeah. I mean, that, that was the, the hardest part. You're, you're just some kid. What, what could you possibly know? And why, why do you think you have a, like a, you know, a right to tell us about something that's technology based? I had a guy tell me one time that I was as intimidating as talking to a female auto mechanic after a, a big conference. So it's, it's that I didn't do the corporate thing. I didn't have to climb the, the ladder, but I got put in to big rooms with conferences and big speaking engagements where the generation was different and they couldn't figure out well how is this person already a ceo and so young and they're telling me about all this tech stuff and i feel really stupid right now yeah so it was that kind of i'm gonna push back on you and i'm gonna try to squash you because you climb too fast you you got too far too fast how come there wasn't somebody checking you? Oh, wow. And so it's different because I was to go another avenue um, and that didn't go corporate. And so that I had a lot of pushback, you know, men and women who felt like, well, that wasn't fair. Why didn't you pay your dues? And now you're telling me about stuff I don't know. And I'm feeling really scared and afraid that I'm going to lose my job. Mm -hmm. So you had some of that jealousy uh, early on. Um, just disdain for, for someone that didn't have to pay their dues. Uh, I think, too, social media and technology, people get intimidated easily because yeah. like, you have to be well-versed in a lot of different um, channels, tech, whatever, um, and it threatens them, and it threatens their career path and, and what they believe to be true about having a career. So you're upsetting the balance of power. And you're causing a, such a loud disruption that people have to go, well, did I do it wrong? Um, am I behind? This is scaring me. So it was more or less that uh, being a catalyst for change, not everyone likes that. Right. So um, I do, I do want to know, it sounds like you're doing great things, but what's on the horizon for you? Well, um, well. My daughter turned one yesterday. Wow, congratulations. Thank you. And I'm doing the single mom thing. Okay. So my life, as far as what's on my horizon, it looks so much different than it did, you know, over a year ago when all I was thinking about was how am I going to build my business? How am I going to make it bigger? You know, what other countries are we going to go into? And now it's how, how do I really strike a, a balance in my life? And I know that word gets thrown around way too much. But it sucks some days. You feel like you either did a bad job being a parent or you had to half-ass something at work. And, and it's how do you create peace and harmony inside and, and keep your spiritual balance and keep achieving. So what looks like, you know, what's on my immediate horizon, I want to make sure that I walk a fine line between being a great mom and building my business. So I have quality time with my daughter and, you know, that she has a great life and I still keep get to achieving my career goals. And I think you ask anyone that's a mom and a career, that's not easy to do. No. And, and I, we talk about it all the time, but I don't know if any of us have found an answer. I hear you, sister. I hear you. I mean, it's... Um... I don't think there is really a balance, honestly. It's like you just kind of 
do what's in front of you and you just try to make it work. My goal is to get out more and, and be more of an educator and to kind of pay it forward, pay back some of the, you know, the mentors who helped me along the way. I want to be able to, to tell people the things that I learned and, and share that with them. So that's, you know, being, doing more public speaking, doing more press interviews, focusing more on entrepreneurship um, and, and female entrepreneurs is, is a huge pillar that we've identified for, you know, the business. And so, well, will that grow the business? Yeah, it probably will. But it's more about bringing my, my story and, and my side to the table and being able to show people I'm much more than a social media company. I have lived through big trials and tribulations. I get how hard it is to run a business. I know how hard it is to run the books, build a business, bring in investment capital, keep clients happy. And, and so I have a lot of that to offer where you know, some social media companies, you're working with an account exec. They don't know what it's like to, to suffer. They don't know what it's like to necessarily have a really bad business day. And so that empathy and that ability to make fast changes to a business model, because the marketing, that is just the output of a, of a stable business model. Yeah. And if anything's not working on the marketing, it's because there's an unhealthy business behind the scenes. So I'm looking at it, and that's part of this, you know, getting that story out there. It's, it's why the new promotional video was made. And, and it's also to tell people, just don't stop. Whatever, whatever happened to you, wherever you didn't go to school or you did go to school or how much money you have, there's probably a way around it. And, it's, and we have the technology today to make that happen. So I want to get this story out there more. That is a, a huge focus for me. Yeah, definitely. And before we go, please let everyone know where they can find more about you and your business. Sure. Well, uh, JenningsSocialMedia.com is our, our website. We do a weekly blog. I'm very active on Twitter, which is at Valerie Jennings. Um, and I'm, you know, I use all the social media channels like everyone else, Google Plus, LinkedIn, they can find me there. Um, you know, I, I'm pretty open. Um, if anyone ever wants to email me, it's Valerie at JenningsSocialMedia.com. I love taking questions. Um, I'm happy to, to just kind of, to just talk. So yeah. yeah. Thank you so much. It definitely was a pleasure. Um, very awe inspiring for sure. And I love that you're a mom and you're balancing, um, running a business and playing mom. I mean, we all can, I mean, well, a lot of us can relate to that. So thank you so much. And thank you everyone for joining us and make sure you check out iGirl Tech News at iGirlTechNews.com. And until next time, everyone be good.